And this bothers me, frankly. Because you know what, they've done that. We've, we've all, I'm not accusing anyone of the, the old people, the ancients, or us. Because we've all done it. And we've all been doing it. And that's why it seems that we're in some of the same places that Israel has always, has always been. Okay, is because we're still trying to, we're still trying to go around the mountain again. Okay, and this is kind of this is kind of the problem that's been I, in in this particular passage uh, that was read, and actually the whole Torah portion that was read, is talking about the idea of being clean and unclean. And we've listened, we've I I've listened, act frankly, and taught for years about the same thing that teachers have been teaching on in this passage uh, over what, what the scripture, si- scriptural situation that makes someone unclean, and they should do this, okay? They should teach this. But I really don't think that we have a clue about what these passages are really talking about and what they really mean. For instance, the Hebrew word for clean is tahar, okay? And it means clean, pure, and is used as in a material or or natural sense, such as gold, not having impurities in it, okay? As well as both ritual and ethical sense. Tahar tahar, uh, would describe the gold furnishings of the tabernacle, okay, that were set apart, that were pure. Things like the ark, things like the the mercy seat, the table. And in in some instances, especially um, in in some of the Psalms, it's talking about promises of cleansing the people. Let's go to Psalm uh, chapter 51. Go to verse 2. And it says, actually, let's just look at verse 1 and 2. It says, Be gracious to me, Yahweh, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Now, David is, is obviously talking about there was a sin there that he had committed that he was asking for forgiveness for. Not only forgiveness, not, li- not only forgiveness, but he was asking for cleansing. He was asking for it to be removed. Fifty-one uh, seven. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Where do we get the idea of hyssop? Where did that come from? It, it come from some of the cleansing rituals, right? Okay. And we also see high set dripped in blood that painted the, doors, the doorposts in the lintel with, with the, the blood of the lamb. And hyssop was put in the water to make it uh, pure, the bad water pure. Mm-hmm. Verse 10. Yahweh, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. These are things that Paul, or excuse me, David is crying out, this, do this within me. All of these things has to do with the heart of the people and removing idols from the people's hearts, the impure things. As we look, at, as we look around us today, it's not hard to see the idols, is it? Sometimes it's hard to see the idols in our hearts. And that's, what, that's where it needs to go to. What is it we're actually cleansing? What is it that we're actually looking at? Now, I realize that this has to do with sin, because I want to point out two different things here. The word unclean is to me... 
and, and it's to become unclean or to be defiled, which means to corrupt, and, and, uh, corrupt the, the purity or, or, or perfection of something. So it means to fix something that should not be there or to add, to add something that's, that's not meant to be there in its original state. Turn with me to Luke. Chapter 11. Verse 39. Starting at verse 39. Well, let's start at 37. As he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to, to dine with him. So he, he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed that, that he did not first perform the ritual of washing before dinner. But, the, but ya, the master said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the, the outside of, of the cup and dish, but inside you are fully, uh, full of greed and evil. Fools, d don't, don't he who, who made the outside uh, make the inside too? But give from, from what is within to the poor. And he, and he goes on and he talks about this inside cleansing. See, they used to, they used to cleanse the outside of the cup and everything to where, and wash their hands. Do you know the priests were washing their hands in the tabernacle, but there was never anything spoken about them washing their hands as a people? When they lost the temple, that ended up being the ritual that was passed on to the people. You see what I mean? So what he's saying is, wait a minute, you're washing the outside things, but you're not concerned with what's inside. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Let's go to verses 14 through 18. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteous and lawlessness? Or what fellowship do, does light have with darkness? What agreement does the Messiah have with, with Baal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement has Yahweh, sanctuary, have with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living Elohim. And, and Elohim said, I will dwell among them and, and walk among them. And I will, I will be their Elohim and they will be my people Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says, says the master. Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will, I will uh, welcome you. I will be your fa a father to you, and you will be the, the sons and daughters to me, says the, Yahweh Almighty. Paul uses the same concept that, that's being taught about our, our, our relationships. And what he, what he wants us to see is that, that he does not want to see the defilement that can come from touching what is unclean through our mixing of righteousness and unrighteousness. In our relationships, when we make a covenant relationship with lawlessness. Now, this has nothing to do with, with what, looks, what looks on the outside, this has something to do with, with us making uh, covenant relationships with, with darkness. Right? Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. It says, in the beginning, uh, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. 
Now the earth was, was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. Yahweh saw that, that, it was good, that light was good, and, and Elohim separated the light from the darkness. Now notice that it says that the earth was without form. The Hebrew word that is translated without form is, is waste, confusion, and worthlessness. It also says that there was darkness, and the Hebrew word for darkness is, is actually a word that doesn't mean the absence of light. It, means, it can be translated dark, but it doesn't, that's not all the word. There's actually another word that could have been used in the Hebrew for dark. Okay? But this particular word is, is koshek, and it, and it means actually can be translated not only dark, but misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. In verse 3, Yahweh brought forth light. And the Hebrew word there is or. We see it again in, in the Exodus, which, uh, which when, they, when they were in dark, but the, the Israelites were in light. And it means light, but it also means happiness. That he brought happiness to what was misery and destruction and death and sorrow. That's what Paul is saying. What does light have to do with what does what does light and happiness have to do with dark misery, destruction, sorrow, and death? The reason I'm bringing this about is because there's a common theme, and the common theme is that he is bringing us into life and not death. Yahweh's relationship with us is about life, not death. But we haven't got that because we are still the mindset of death. And that's why, that's what happens to us. Paul says in, in, in Romans chapter 7 that what happens with, with us when we follow the letter of the law, we receive death. Not life. Paul's talking about in, in, in Romans 7, 6, Paul's talking of this tension between the spirit and the letter. And really what he's talking about is the intent of the letter. What is the intent of the letter? Can we talk about that for a minute? Here's the intent, okay? Here's what he's talking about. I want you, I want you to take hold of this. But what he's talking about is the very intentions that, that the law was about. That's the spirit. What were his, Yahweh's real intentions? Now, if, I'm going to talk about this at 11 o'clock service too, not just this. There's going to go into more length. But the truth is, is his intentions were to bring us from death to life. Do you have something to say? Well, everybody else. So. so it seems to me like the law is still uh, to our benefit when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we yield to it, it actually cuts the, uh, the things of our fallen nature off of us. So the intent of the law was always to help us. But the Spirit is compassion and love and acts of mercy. And so the royal law becomes mercy always trumps judgment. Okay, but we can also become ceremonially unclean. Okay, in what happened during the time of Adam and Eve. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. read uh, verses 18 through 24. 
It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth uh, comparing with the glory that is coming to be, to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly, eagerly awaits and anticipates for Yahweh's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who was subjected, who subjected it in, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of Yahweh's children. For, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for adoption, the adoption of our bodies. Now in this hope we are saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what, what, we, what we do not see, we eagerly wait for, for it with patience. Listen, when Adam and Eve fell, the whole creation was turned corruption. I want you to think about this. If the whole creation turned to corruption, what are we walking on? Corruption, all right? So we can become ceremonially unclean. He's he's talking in, 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 uh, in Leviticus 12, he's talking about childbirth. He's not talking about a sin. Is it a sin to have a child? No. But what he's talking about is all of the stuff that's dead that, that gets expelled. And, they're ex- and the woman is exposed to death. And becomes unclean or defiled while she's in that period of time. What is Yahweh? He's life, right? What is this world, this corruption? It's death, right? I, I would like to comment on that. Uh, the priests went through a, a cleansing and they had to be clean to be presented towards Yahweh. But one, some things we don't think about, the temple, it, um, there was dung haulers in the temple. These were priests that went through the cleansing process. But they did get unclean doing their job. But the temple could not function without them. They were in Yahweh's will, even though they performed an act that would make them unclean. Turn with me to John chapter 13. We're going to be taking a look at 1 through 11. John 13, 1 through 11. It says, Before the Passover festival, Yeshua knew that his hour had come to depart from the world, this world to the Father. Having loved his own, his own who, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now by the time of supper, the devil had already put, put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscot's son, to betray him. Yeshua knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from Elohim and that he, he was going back to Elohim. So he got up from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his, his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel uh, tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Yeshua answered him, what I'm, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but afterwards you will know. You will never wash my feet, ever, Peter said. Yeshua replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Master, not only my feet, 
but, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Yeshua uh, told him, doesn't need to be washed except with, for his feet, but he is completely clean. Are you clean? But not all of you. For, and he was talking about, he goes on to talk about that part of it was Judas. But why is Yeshua saying that you're, you're clean except for your feet? It's because he was walking around, right? Go ahead. I was feeling like when you were saying that, that that, that becomes the true um, preparation of the gospel of peace and washed. I mean, there's so much in that, so many layers. Washed in the word um, to expose the evil intent you're, in you're the, the man or woman's okay. heart. He was talking about that he, he was washed. Who was the word? You Him, himself. <laughs> Yeshua is the word. Yeshua is the word himself. Yeah. He and is he, the word. The word he became washed, flesh he and dwelt him, right? among us. Yeah. Okay, all except for where man had walked on the earth and the corruption was still there. And he still needed That's good. the cling. Exactly. And then he says he's all clean. He will be exalted. So that would be ceremonially unclean, right? And then Yeshua had made him clean and then washed his feet to where he was all clean. Now if we go back to Leviticus, each of these things that, we're, that they're looking through these passages have to do with something that's unclean, if you will. But it, it's, it, each of these things it has to do with coming into t- contact with death and dying. For instance, the blood, and I'm talking about uh, Leviticus 12 through 15. Uh, dying or death, for instance, the blood that comes from childbirth is dead, and it, and it has contact with, with uh, during that time, the cleansing of the skin and the infection, also dealing with dead. What is an infection? It's part of your body that attacks something that shouldn't be there, Right? And then it, what, what does it form? It forms a boil. And then what does it do? It bursts or whatever, and it, and, and it, it, it actually exposes dying stuff. Unless you attack it with the antibodies that are the Word of God. Right. Let's go back to Matthew. Chapter 22. Verses 28 through 32. Let's, let's actually start in, in uh, 22. It says, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they, they left him and went away. The same day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came up to him and question him, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother is to, to marry his wife and raise up the offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among, the, among us. The first got, got married and died having no offspring. He left his wife to, be, to a brother. The same happened to the second also, and the third and all to the seventh. Then in the last, last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she be uh, of the seven? For they all had, had married her. Yeshua answered them, you are deceived, because you don't know the scripture or the power of, of Yahweh. For in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by, by Elohim. I am, the, I am the, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of J- Jacob. He's not the, the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. Come on. Yeah. 
He came so that you could have life and have it more abundant. He didn't come so you could be dead. You see what I mean? When we, this, this whole idea is that he does not want us to be around death, but he knows that because the, the world we live in, we're going to become defiled. I need to hear you guys talk. You're too quiet. I was thinking about um, in Genesis where the whole earth became corrupt. And I was thinking about the responsibility of man because he was told to subdue the earth. And in that, so that put earth underneath him. And so when he was corrupt, it corrupted everything. Just like if your leader is corrupt, those who are following you are all going to be corrupted. Come on. This is uh, also the story of the Good Samaritan, where the priest walks by the man on the road that's injured. And to touch him would have made him ceremonially unclean, and he couldn't have performed his work for Yahweh that day, the, the work. And this is a great example of this. But yet this Samaritan, who was already ritually unclean, helped the man. And Yeshua asked the question, <laughs> Who did right in the sight of Yahweh? The clean or the unclean in, our, in, in a physical sense? Who was actually clean and who was actually unclean? In, earlier you were talking about the fact that when Jesus approached the Pharisees, he was talking about that they washed the outside of the cup but not the inside of the cup. And, that brought me to uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is, I call upon you, therefore, brethren, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, well-pleasing, and perfect desire of Elohim. And the, the internal be, gets corrupted, and I believe that it starts with the mind. Because if you think about a sin or an a act that is against Yahweh, then it's, much, it's only then that the body can even perform that action. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5, it says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Yeshua Messiah is in you, unless you fail the test? My question is this. How often do we think about this? We're, we're supposed to be, and we're going we're, we're, to we'll take a look at this, we're supposed to be um, temple a temple of, of, and we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. But we, there's also another aspect is we gather as a larger group, we become a larger picture of that temple. And we, we are actually coming into his presence on a day that he's appointed. How often do we think about examining ourselves and see what condition that we're in before we come in? to make sure that we're not defiled. And he's talking about to make sure you're in the faith. Did you get that? He says make sure you're in the faith. What does it mean to be in the faith? Oh, we're going to talk about that later. Because he just brought it up, and I'll bring it up here, and I'll bring it up again later. Shua said that there were two commands that were the most important is to love Yahweh with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength 
And the second was like it. He said to love your brother as yourself. And he says that on these two commands, the rest hang. You know what that means? And I'm going to talk about it later, and we're going to go into it more depth later. You know what that means? Is that everything is done, those letter becomes spirit when everything is done because they're so in love with Yahweh. Ooh, that's good. It's through that love that those, that, that those commandments are applied. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 4 through 5. But each person should examine his own work. And then he will have a reason for boasting uh, in himself alone. And not in the respect to someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load I'm going to tell you a little story. A number of years ago, um, I don't remember how, how long ago exactly, I, we were, it was during Sukkot, and I had left there because I had to come home and get some stuff, and I had to go back up there because I had to speak that night. I think it was laundry we had to do. And trust me, it was bad enough where you didn't want me to come to service that night. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, when I, we did the laundry and got fresh clothes on, and I rushed out of there because I, we were in a big hurry to get back up there. And when I got back up there, I realized that I didn't, was not wearing my sea seats. Well, I'm not going to go back because I don't have no time to, to do that, right? So I, I went ahead and taught, and I no more than finished and said amen than I had three people rush toward me and scold me for teaching without tea seats on. <laughs> the problem with that is, is that was the letter of the law. Because the truth is, what I wear, my, my tea seats that I wear, are not for you. They're for me. Okay? That's why he's saying you need to examine yourselves. We also need to examine ourselves on what spirit we're in when we do do these things. Amen? Amen. Because could it be that we commit sin because we're not doing things according to the spirit rather than the letter? Could that be? And these are the things that I want to discuss because this is about examining our own hearts on where we are with stuff. I'm going to tell you something. I've come over the years. My wife had helped me a lot with this. I've come over the years that if, if something ticks me off, I'm not going to address it until I get over that attitude because chances are What's going to come out of me is not spirit. It's, it'll be a lot of flesh, okay? And I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Because then it hurts people. Then it becomes hurtful rather than helpful. So... Said, and I feel like the Spirit was confirming the very same message that you're talking about today um, in my secret place before um, service this morning. And I wanted to bring this up because in the same chapter we're in, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. 
Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 7, chapter 7. I want to take a look at verses 6 and 7. This one actually is a big correction for me, um, for myself. And it says, For you are a holy people, belonging to Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh your Elohim has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Yahweh was devoted to you, chose you, not because you were more numerous than, than all the peoples, for you are the fewest of the peoples, but because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath he swore to your, your fathers, he brought you out with a strong arm. This has nothing to do with us, folks. It has to do that he loves us. And he drew us. He drew us to himself. Now, if, if that's the case... <laughs> this is the check, okay? If that's the case, and Yahweh loves each one of you, how should I treat you? With love, right? Let's go back to First John. John's kind of an interesting guy. You know, if you picture him in your mind, and I don't know if, if you guys have been around fishermen very much, but when Sharon and I were on the coast, we were around him all the time when I was pastoring on the coast. A lot of fishermen are not exactly uh, gentle, gentleman-type people. <laughs> they can be pretty coarse, okay? And if you, if you ever look at their job, you know why in some cases. So when I look at John and think about him being a fisherman, the things he said doesn't actually equate the things in my mind that, that I conjure, you know, that come up about John the fisherman, right? But this guy is amazing. He's just amazing. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. Elohim is light, and there's absolutely no darkness in him. If we say that we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now here it is, okay? Here it is, is that if we're having trouble with one another, then we need to go back to check our relationship with the, with the Father. Right? This is, uh, I think, more for the men in the congregation, myself included. Uh, the Lord revealed to me that I've got to unmask before I ever get the helmet of salvation right. Amen. They, that, that speaks to, for me, that speaks to uh, humbling myself, mm -hmm. doing the Word of God, and proclaiming the truth. I used to, I used to make the joke that, that when we come into church, we need to check our church faces at the door. Okay, because you know what? It, it's true. I mean, we have, to, we have to admit it's true. I know that when I was a parent, oftentimes I was not in the best spiritual shape when I showed up to church. If you've tried to wrestle kids, get them dressed, get them fed, and get here on time, it's insanity, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You're asking your wife, tell me again why we had these kids. <laughs> Remind me, right? No, <laughs> so... 
And the point is, is that when, you, when we arrived, I'm not talking about you guys, no, when we arrived at church, we stopped, put on a smile, and walked in. <laughs> Hi, brother. <laughs> Blessings to you. <laughs> Amen? It's, it's about where our heart is. You know, when I went to seminary, what they told me is that what you need to do is the night before, you need to lay out everybody's clothes that they're going to wear. Okay? And you need to, to already know what everybody's going to have for breakfast. You need to plan how much time it's going to take, get everybody fed, get them bathed or whatever you need to do, and get them to... Uh, get them to the building on time. And that will cut down your stress on then Sunday morning, right? And you know what? It works. It works with a little planning. It works better, right? I had a child that every word out of my mouth had to be don't. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> you know <laughs> That child was actually my parents. That child was saying, that's your payback. <laughs> my dad got so frustrated, it was don't. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> he couldn't get the words out fast enough. To... But you know what? This is really about where we're at in this relationship with him. Where we're at personally. Within a relationship with him. You know what, he did not, even though he's made us as a group, he treats us as individuals. He wants that personal relationship with each of us. And that's what he's saying here, is that if we walk in the light with him, it's amazing how he puts this, it says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I still just feel like God has been saying that the golden key for all of this falling into place is the golden rule. And when we can teach that to truly think about someone else's needs over our own, it takes you through the process of dying to yourself. And then he shows you idols or the word shows you idols they come before him and we all know he will have no other God before him and so just our willingness to let him strip us of that idolatry and then we fall more in love and more in love and we have more to pour out and he's going to work a miracle out of this house bona fide anybody have anything more to say Any comments, any thoughts about this? You know, I remember a long time ago, um, setting, being one of the people that sat in the congregation and so forth, and I would listen to the pastor well, I'll tell you one about myself. I would go back, when I was pastoring, I'd, go, I'd preach, and I'd go back to the, to the door, uh, and we'd open the door, and I would greet people as they left, right? <laughs> it would blow your mind to hear the topics of things I preached that day. <laughs> I, was, I quit doing that because I was, I was, I was thinking, maybe I'm not... Get it, I'm not clear. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but but uh, that way I, I maintain my own sanity, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it amazes me how um, there's diff different aspects of people's lives where they'll hear certain things in that whole thing. 
and that their walk away is, is an area that touched that area in their life. Um, and so it, it, was, it was pretty cool. But anyway, I, some of it, I, maybe it's about some of it, what I heard or when I studied was about another area of my life that it was touching and, and that he was touching and, and uh, affecting that part of my life. You know, so um, it's kind of interesting how he works these things through his, his people. And uh, that's why I like to hear, I sit up here now so that I'm not baffled standing at a door. <laughs> I stand up here now and, and listen to what people's thoughts are. That way I don't fall down, I'm sitting down, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, that's why I like to hear what you guys have to say. And I also think that, that as we talk things out and we, as we process, it helps us process those things as we get into them. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I'm done. I'll go ahead and pray and you can fellowship until the 11 o'clock service. Father, we just thank you so much for your word and for how you deal with this. Father, we just thank, that, that, thank you that somehow out of all this, out, out of the way that we do things, that you love us. And I, I guess I'm baffled by that on how you still love me um, because I've done some crazy things and uh, still you love me and I thank you for each of these people here that you love them too that no matter what they've done you still love them and that you're still wanting to to pull everything that 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 you can out of the world out of them to where they can be in this relationship that is uncluttered uh, by the world's defilement. I just thank you for these things in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. I still believe there's Torah, folks, so... Um... <laughs>